hi we're on the second part of the trip to Jordan I did part one last week it's not been a prolific trip so far We've really been struggling for photographs there's birds about but I'm not getting close to them 50 meters and they start to fly away from me but we're now heading south we've got the Dead Sea on our right hand side and then Israel and we're heading down to Agaba right down at the southern end there's a wetland area there i'm just hoping that's going to change my fortunes there's a wetland area up north azrak and that was very poor so crossing the fingers that things improve as i go further south what we're doing as we're driving is i'm just seeing a dirt track and thinking i'll go off and explore it any suitable dirt track i go down as I've got older, I've definitely become more cautious on where I drive, and I didn't drive anywhere where there was any chance of soft sand. It had to be hard ground. In last week's film, I ended up showing some pictures of backlit camels from the Oman, and said I'd very much like to reshoot these if I could find the right situation. I found some camels. We didn't have much of a sunrise, and in fact it's raining at the moment, but for probably about five minutes. There was a bit of a glow in the sky and I got some silhouettes. As well as looking for a herd of camels and a suitable sunrise or sunset, you also need a spot where there's no electricity pylons or telegraph wires in the background and that can be hard to find. I didn't like this picture because you can't see the bottom of the camel's legs and that can be solved to a degree by getting down lower and having that articulated viewing screen on the back of the camera makes it so much easier to get down to the ground. All of the silhouettes were underexposed by about one stop to make the camel darker, and they're all taken with wide-angled lenses. There's no problems getting close to these camels. They're not wild camels. There's very few wild camels left in the world of either species. So these are owned by people and very used to people. What you've got to watch with camels is if they don't like you, they spit at you. And it's a horrible, sticky, gooey spit. You don't want it to happen. You can see the animal on the right has been shackled so it can't walk too far. And then the owner of the camels turned up and gave them a drink. This was the only day of the trip when it wasn't sunny. And it does mean it extends your photographic time because you can photograph in the midday light. And you can't do that when it's sunny. There's some bee eaters over there, almost certainly little green bee eaters. We'll see if we can get closer to them. I did get close and surprisingly easy, but there's a problem. What is that? It's on the bird's foot. It looks like a big lump of mud. Looking at it as a stills picture, you can see there's something wrong with the feathering as well. Now I should be calling this bird the Arabian green bee-eater because it's one of those species that has been split and it all gets a bit confusing and some of the splitting was only done in 2021. It's one of those things about bird photography that the individual bird you get closest to, the easiest, has something wrong with it. It's damaged, it's sickly. And that's not just luck or bad luck. That's because the bird is sick and they are more approachable when they're slight, slightly ill. So it's, a, it's very noticeable. You time and time again get closer to slightly sick birds. I don't know whether you can tell, but this car is absolutely full of flies. As soon as I open the window, Oh, dozens of them come in. They're not biters, they're just little fruit flies, but they're very irritating. Fortunately, this bird, who was in much better condition, was also easily approachable. It's the first really approachable bird that I've had in Jordan. Now, the idea with these beaters is not to drive straight at them, to go as if I'm going to go past them. They don't feel threatened if you're going to go past as opposed to going straight towards them. And of course that lets me shoot out the side window. But then what I'm watching is the background. Do I want a green background? Do I want the out of focus sort of sandy colour? Well actually I do. I want the sandy colour ideally. That looks better to me. So you've just got to 
move forward until I'm in the right spot and this will do it. I felt I wanted this colour background instead of green because it contrasts to the bird. I didn't really want a green bird against a green background, although when I looked at the pictures on the computer afterwards I was actually very happy with the pictures against the green background too. And there's only one thing better than a bee eater and that's to have two bee eaters. Or how about three bee eaters? Now because you get extra depth of field with a Micro Four Third camera I don't have to bother to close down in a situation like this. You get two stops of extra depth of field per aperture. So all those birds are in focus even though I'm shooting wide open. Also got a yellow vented bauble on the same location and that's the background I like. That's the colour of the out of focus sand in the distance and here against the green bush. In the days when I was able to make a living at my wildlife photography it would be vital to me to get lots of different backgrounds, different colours because then I could send different pictures to different picture libraries because there were some libraries didn't want the same photograph as you sent elsewhere so you had to take the picture several times, different perches, different backgrounds. Not a very good picture of a Namaqua dove but the only one I got they were not very approachable unlike this hoopoe Hoopoos are often very approachable from cars. And a white wagtail. Because you're shooting at 50 frames per second, when it opens its mouth, you tend to get it without any effort. The style of driving in, in Jordan is very different to back home, and it's a bit hairy at times. But then again, I come from Birmingham, and there's parts of Birmingham that are pretty frightening to drive in. There's parts of Birmingham now that I boycott, not because of the volume of traffic, because of the standard of the driving, so I'm sort of used to it. But it makes a big difference that I've got the TomTom Tom GPS with me. I don't have to worry about map reading. I'm getting very clear instructions about which turning to take, and it's only really in the city is that it becomes a, a problem. But I had a problem with the GPS right at the beginning. I drove for about an hour after I picked up the hire car and the GPS just died because the battery was flat. So it just wasn't charging and it took me about a, an hour of messing about and going into various shops to work out that none of the cigarette lighters in the car were working. There was two in the front and one in the back and it was all dead. But I had to buy new cables, new USB plugs to prove that it wasn't my stuff that was faulty and then I went to various places seeing if anybody could fix it for me. It's just going to be a fuse but finding out which fuse is going to be quite difficult. So eventually I contacted the, the hire car company and I felt a bit silly saying your car's no good to me because it's got no cigarette lighter. I can't run my GPS but finding your way around in Jordan without a GPS is quite difficult to do. Anyway, very impressed with them. They said, if you can tell us where you are, we will bring you a new car. It's about an hour's drive for them. So I headed into the nearest town, found a hotel, photographed the hotel, sent them the picture, plus a picture of a, a, a building on the other side of the road they should recognise, and an hour later they turned up with a new car. I thought that was very good, just for a cigarette lighter. And just a few other pictures I took during the trip. This is a willow warbler and a not very good picture of a desert lark and finally a steppe eagle. Much easier to photograph than golden eagles, they are quite approachable. Even on foot I've got close to steppe eagles. We'll just take a look at downloading the pictures when you're away on a trip like this. I reckon the world of wildlife photography is divided about 50-50 between those that take a laptop with them and those that don't. And I can understand the logic of those that don't want to take a laptop. They're on a trip, they're on a holiday. They don't want to spend their evenings on the computer downloading, downloading pictures and looking at them. And it certainly can spoil it socially. I never take my laptop down to the social area, the bar, the restaurant, if I'm away with a group, because you end up not talking to each other. Everybody's just looking at their pictures and oohing and ahhing, and um, it does spoil it a bit. But I do take a laptop with me. Digital photography has many advantages, 
but the biggest single advantage is the ability to review your pictures as you go. You don't have to wait to the end of the trip and then a fortnight before your Kodachrome films are processed anymore. You can look at your pictures on the back of the camera, but better still to look at them on a laptop. So it's very important to me. It really speeds up the learning curve. So I can look at my pictures and it gives me an idea of what I want to do tomorrow. Maybe I didn't get something quite right or it gives me new ideas for tomorrow. I'm seeing what I'm getting right, what I'm getting wrong. So when I download the pictures, I create one folder. So for this trip, it's a folder called Jordan. And then that's subdivided into folders called day one, day two, day three. And I think if you don't do that, if you don't subdivide your pictures, you'll get into a muddle. As you're downloading your pictures, you'll be get confused as to which ones you've downloaded. So it's very important to do it day one, day two. I might have cards from several different cameras. So I'll have the Panasonic G86 card and then the Olympus. And in fact, I've got more than one Olympus body, so I could have two cards from those. Um, and then there's the GoPro camera and the camera that I record to camera with like I'm doing now. So it's quite a few cards and you'll get mixed up. So have day one, day two. And if I'm in a country where, let's say Africa, where you do a definite morning gain drive and then an afternoon gain drive, I'll download the midday as well. So I'll have a, a day one A and a day one B, just to avoid any confusion. When I first started to shoot digitally, I bought one of these. It's an Epsom downloader. And this has got an 80 gig drive in it, which at the time would have seemed enormous because the cards we were shooting with were probably two gigabytes, four gigabytes maybe. So you've got a lot of cards on there. Today, I wouldn't even get one card under here. So I haven't used this for years, but I still carry it with me as a backup in case something goes wrong with my laptop. And it's got a, a quite a nice large screen on it. So if I had to download to this, I could edit and delete pictures as I go easier than on the back of the camera. So I still carry it with me, but mainly I carry two external hard drives with me. These happen to be Seagate's, they're three terabytes and I've never filled three terabytes up yet. So I'm taking three copies. I'm downloading my pictures to the laptop, to the C drive, and then taking two copies every day to the external drives. So this is about the size of a cigarette pack and not much heavier either. And it makes me feel very secure that I've got three copies of all my pictures. And of course, when I'm flying home, these don't go in your hold luggage, they go in as your hand luggage or one in your coat pocket and one in your camera bag, just to keep spreading the risk. Thanks for watching.